Hello, my juicy co-creators. Lilu here on the Juicy Living Tour in California, in sunny, beautiful California, in Boulder Creek, Colorado. Uh, California. I always want to say Colorado when I hear Boulder, but no, 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 no. This is in beautiful Northern California, and I'm at the Heart Math Institute. I know a lot of you guys have heard about the Heart Math, and it comes in many, many conversations, many interviews. Actually, I do with authors, with athletes, with entrepreneurs. Uh, bring up heart math because you have done crucial studies over the last 20 years mm -hmm. and it's absolutely beautiful you have done and i'm really delighted to dig into it today thank you howard Lilu, thank you very much for having me greetings to everyone who's watching this video we're here as she mentioned in in northern california i wonder how much my mail goes to boulder colorado you know <laughs> but we're here in northern california we have a beautiful summer sunny day here to sit and have a, a conversation about things that i think both of us uh, think matter because we feel, um, I, I, I feel some things, but I like to ground it in the scientific, you know, in science. And so it feels like this society is really or wants to move, or part of this society wants to move into a heart based society, you know, leaving fear away. We can feel already and see in our lives that we get much bigger results and much, we're much happier when we, when we are, um, when we are in this flow and things are aligned and things are, um, how do you say this? How do you describe this life that is absolutely working perfectly? <laughs> This juicy life. Good question. <laughs> well, I can say the world is changing. We both yes. know that. We see that because we we both have an opportunity to travel and, and talk to a lot of different people. So, a new world is emerging right in the midst of the old one, and I think that it's part of a, a big evolutionary shift in consciousness that's occurring that we're participating in and have an opportunity to be involved in during our lifetime. It's a very exciting but also very challenging time to live. So a new world that's more heart-centric, more the qualities of the heart, not just the sentiment of the heart, but the qualities of cooperation and peace and you know, consideration for others and all those kind of things that are a part of heart is emerging uh, as we speak. And as it pushes out, the old one pushes back. We feel the friction when the two meet. We see that on the news, and that's what we tend to identify with sometimes. But there's a big change occurring in consciousness, and people are choosing to have a life that's very different than the one they have. The roar of ambition is not serving us as well as it used to. Um, feeling separate from one another, the, the judgments and things, that they don't seem to be working for a lot of people today. It's still very prevalent as we speak and we see that very clearly uh, but we are shifting very quickly now i think in you know this major shift in consciousness that's occurring is happening in a very short amount of time maybe over a, only a hundred year period which in a lifetime is a long time but in the context of, of global evolution it's a it's mm -hmm. a blip and it's just a short amount of time so it's an interesting window of time where we're creating a new world and the life that we'll live is a life that has you know more flow less stress Uh, certainly more feelings of fulfillment, yeah. you know, being fulfilled by life, not seeing life as a struggle, not seeing life as something that, you know, we're trying to get through, not just trying to survive, but we're trying but really uh, an opportunity to thrive in the environment. And that's what I really want for people. People have asked me, you know, from time to time why I've done this and 20 some years down the road now, why I continue to do it. And my answer, usually, this is usually the end of the interview, by the way, but <laughs> but my, my answer is that, you know, I want people to have their fulfillment. I think we're born into this world with, with like a package, let's say, a present. And part of the game of life is to unwrap the present. And within there, there's wonderful things that are unique to us, things that are fulfilling externally, things that are fulfilling internally, lots of different things. But because we get lost along the way, we don't necessarily ever unwrap the package. We barely get the bow off sometimes. And I see that happening to people, and I don't think it's, uh, it's necessary. And so what I want is for people to be fulfilled yeah. in their own way. I don't have a prescription for what that is for them, yeah. but in their own way. And that's what I really want. My belief is, my personal experience from many, many years of, of, of self-discovery and from the work I've done here at HeartMath is that that comes from listening to and following the guidance of the heart, the intuitive heart that we all have inside of us. Because a lot of people in society use uh, actually um, medicine or, or some other things, you know, to put the band-aids on the, on the, on the, it just not feeling, we don't feel good. And then we use all those outside tools when really you're saying through the heart, it's possible to heal and to live a fulfilling life. Yeah. When you have more connection to the, to, to what, 
I call heart, you know, the core of our authentic self, uh, the source of intuition and wisdom. We've been talked about for thousands of years. When you're in contact with that, when that becomes your baseline, the norm of how you live your life, then uh, you require less of certain types of stimulation to feel happy and fulfilled. And that could be drugs or shopping or whatever we do. Nothing wrong with shopping, nothing wrong with enjoying material things, nothing wrong with taking wonderful vacations to exotic places. I'm not down on any of that. But what I have learned along the way is that, you know, true fulfillment and true self-security can never come from those things. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about some things last night, actually. And I was thinking about how um, in my younger years I was a musician. That's what I did. I was a rock musician. And how I spent so many years... Uh, trying to make sure I was in a position where I felt and looked to others larger than I was. And that that was to give myself some sense of fulfillment. And I recognized along the way as I matured the years in that business and years as a, as a performer that it was a house of cards. They could crumble at any minute and that I could not find my fulfillment that way. It was never going to serve me. And that was part of why I actually left music was a pursuit of, of something more that could give me that sense of fulfillment. But it comes from inside out. And this has been said by me and thousands of others for thousands of years, so I'm not saying anything new here. What I will say is new is that we now know definitively through scientific research done here at HeartMath and other places that heart plays a key role in all of this. It's not just a metaphor. It's not just a sentiment. It's not just a philosophical tenet. It's not just from what the ancients said. It's a real and visceral intelligence that we have within ourselves that when activated gives us the keys to fulfillment. So that calls to how do we activate that? How do you measure that? Tune in next week. We'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> next three hours, we'll explain. Segment will be. <laughs> no, I'll share some things with with everyone. I'd, I'd love to do this, of course. But um, you know, when we there was 15 years of work or life, let's put it that way, done by Doc Childry, our founder, myself, and others before we ever had an organization, before we ever started a heart math, and um, when we decided that we wanted to take what we'd learned in, in those years about ourselves and begin to try to share that with the world, there was a couple of things we knew we needed to do. First, it could not be coming from ambition. It had to be coming from true service. We weren't trying to be somebody or, you know, we had had an insight and now we got to write a book about it. I mean, we really, it, was, it had to be coming from a, a more sincere service-oriented place. That was one thing. Another part of, of what we realized is that how we had experienced consciousness and how we'd improved our lives was through the heart. And if we were going to introduce a heart-based system to the world, we better do it different than the way it had been done before. Because it didn't have enough integration into modern society yet. And that we had to build a better bridge between the philosophy of heart and the practicality of modern living. We recognize that one of the things that carries a lot of weight in today's society is science. That that could be the bridge. That, that could be the bridge between the philosophical and the day-to-day -day living, as Doc, our founder says, from sky to street. So we chose science as a way to do that. Our science was not intended to take heart out of heart and make it sterile or something, but it was designed to give it an empirical baseline, a solid understanding that people could rely on that would allow them to believe in something that they already intuitively wanted to believe, which was their heart. And so science was our method for that. So that's kind of what heart math has become in many ways most famous for, even though there's a lot more to heart math than science. So our researchers um, started out years ago trying to look at, you know, the physical heart. We could have started with big cosmic research or something, but we chose to build it from the ground up. Mm -hmm. And it would be more relevant that way and more respected if we built it on, on a, a more conservative basis and built it this way. So we began to look at the physical heart. And what we found was the research that we found scattered throughout the research literature and then, of course, research that we did, is that the heart at a physical level was a lot more than a blood pump. Mm -hmm. It was actually an information processing center in our body. And that information was sent from the heart to the brain and the rest of the body and that all the body's functions were critically dependent upon this information. And that was a big deal. All of a sudden, heart had to be looked at differently. And we, re, we were the ones that, that, in a way, took all that put it together into a, a coherent story that a guy like me can explain to others and put it out to the world. And it began to give a new understanding to heart. So we began to modernize you know, the, what had been said about heart for thousands of years. And that was an important step, I think, in our work and what we've brought to the, you know, sort of the party, so to speak, of the consciousness shift. 
We also recognized science wasn't enough. We had to develop ways in which people could access this intelligence. So we developed a whole system of tools, techniques, and methods, and even developed technology to measure the quality of communication between heart and brain that's sold all over the world. It's very popular. And all those were tools, like a tool kit for somebody to have so that they could learn how to access the intelligence of the heart in order to better empower themselves through these changing times. Empower themselves. It wasn't about dependency on outside things. It goes back to what we talked about in the beginning of our, our little conversation here. Fulfillment's an inside-out job. So these tools and methods and technology we developed are designed for that, to give people the ability to unfold that more within themselves. I find it interesting, almost humorous, is that, you know, we didn't invent anything new. What we did was is we gave ways for people to get at something they already had. It's already in us. Yeah. It's just, you know, how do you, how do you manifest it practically? Mm-hmm. It's already inside us in the first place. So we're born with it, and we lose it as we get older. We lose it as we get older. I think it's. I think we sure do. Because it's 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 it seems the older we get, the more I mean, the more we're we're in harmony with life. We regain it. Some people are more in harmony. Some people go the other direction. But you think about, let's say, one quality of the heart is the ability to get over things quickly. You know, flexibility emotionally to, to be able to get over things. So you can have a young child. The child is on the playground at school playing with the kid, and they get in a little fight, and the teacher says, stop that now, and he breaks them up, and they get all, well, two minutes later, they're playing again. Two adults in the work environment can have a little argument about something, and they can resent that person for the rest of the time they work there. Lack of flexibility, emotional ingrainment, you know, stiffness in our ability to flex and flow with life. Here are some big motorbikes here. Yeah, we do. I wonder what that's about. Anyway, there they are. It sounds like fun. Um, yeah, so that's an example. You know, so I think that, yeah, you know, children in, in general have a tendency to see a sparkle in life. They see, the, they see the world through different eyes, you know, as we grow. It's a natural maturation process. We're not supposed to stay like children forever. But through the natural maturation process, we take on opinions. We take on hard edges. We feel the hurts and the pains of life. We, you know, have all those things that happen to us that sort of imprint in us and begin to take us away from the heart. And even in the society that we, we have today and how it sort of functions, it's like it's an ambition-driven thing. We're supposed to get ahead. We're supposed to take something from someone else in order to better ourselves. It's about what we can get that's beyond what the others can get and those kind of things. And I think that kind of thinking is changing rather dramatically rather quickly. I don't think people value that as much as they used to. At least a large segment of society doesn't. Um, you and I talked about this a little earlier, but, you know, there is sort of two worlds happening. Yeah. You know, it's like, Feels a, like it. big polarization is happening. And so you have people that are right there in the, in the, the world of get ahead, get them before they get you, um, you know, separation, division, you know, all those things, you know. Fear-based fear-based things that are there that's all that all still exists and definitely you know in, in a big time way but in the middle of that there's awful a lot of new that's going on too yeah. and i think a lot of the people that would be taking their time to listen to this interview would be the people who are already seeing that as well so what i'd say to you the listener right now is let's focus more on that let's you know when things come up when there's a tragedy in the world there's a, a break out of a war or a natural disaster or some horrific event that occurs that we see on the news I think the game to play on that is let's try to maintain a sense of compassion but not let it take us down, not let us see the world in despair. Yeah, you know, let's take, gain power from it and take initiatives and be uh, leaders. It's not even leaders because so many words actually don't fit anymore, but it's like let's let's come together. It's hard sometimes. I mean, I think when I look at, um, you know, last year was the year 2012, which, as you know, was a big buildup because of the Mayan calendar yeah. predictions and astrological predictions and things that there was going to be this huge shift that occurred. And a lot of people wanted that to happen, and they wanted to have their beliefs and the work they put into themselves and into society validated in some way by some events of some kind that would show that. And when that came down, not a lot happened. It wasn't like any big event that occurred that gave it that understanding. So when I began to 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 go out from here this year and, and begin my speaking for the year, I was on a in January, I was on a plane to Australia and I realized, you know, I said, what I'm sensing right now is that People did the best they could not to have a lot of anticipation about that. But what's going on in consciousness right now in the folks that have been involved in trying to create a transition in the world is a quiet disappointment. Sort of disappointed that 
not more happen. But what I feel happened was there wasn't any singular or seminal events that occurred, but major shifts in consciousness were taking place, big time. And it takes time for those things to filter down into where we see noticeable change. It doesn't happen in a big blam, you know, and all this change occurs. It's, it integrates in. It's, it's an integrative process. And we're beginning to see that unfold more and more now that we're later in, in the year of 2013. So I think a big change did occur. And uh, what I'd like to say to everyone listening is that you never lose you know your hope about these things i mean the shift is going on anyway it's my in my opinion it's, it's happening whether we like it or not <laughs> it's it becomes a matter of how easy is it how gentle and kind of process is it yeah. but the shift is bigger than humans it's bigger than the earth it's it's it's, it's, it's a big shift through the cosmos so it's happening anyway we're a part of it we're conscious co-creators within it mm-hmm. and we have responsibilities in it What are some of the barriers for this heart to really open and 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 and, and be uh, be really in tune with life and live in con- living this conscious juicy life? Well, that, that's a great question, actually. I think we have to learn to move beyond some of the uh, the habitual mindsets that we have for starters, you know, and we have to want it. That's another thing. You have to really want the desire for for your life to be that way. And yeah. people kind of get there sometimes the hard way, and when they're despairing and things like that, and then they, you know, if you think about it this way, let's say, and we've all had these things in our life, you and me and everybody listening, whether we're confronted with some challenge that goes beyond our ability to figure it out. It goes beyond the logical linear processes of understanding. And when we get to those places, what we often do is we begin to dig a little deeper within ourselves. Yeah. And people do it in various ways. Some people pray. Some people meditate. Some people go out and walk in the woods. Some people get in the car and they drive off into the night, you know, and they're looking for something that they can't figure out from here. And they begin to draw a little deeper to here. Yeah. And when we do that, very often we find there is new security, new inspiration, new hope that we come in contact with. For example, even our inner dialogue may change. I mean, we could be in a situation that's hard and we would maybe all of a sudden by digging a little deeper start having thoughts like, this is really hard and I don't know how I'm going to get through it. But I've gotten through tough things before and I know I'm going to get through it this time too. Well, that's the hard talking, right? So that's wanting it. Now that's wanting it the hard way. Wanting it the easier way is to say, look, I want to make contact with something that it's part of me. It's it's called heart. It's the core of my authentic being. I want more of that in my life. It's I want to move beyond some of the the the, uh, the judgments and some of the barriers and some of the resistances I have, and I want to live more heart centric life. That wanting it first. One of the tricky things that stops us from having that is something that I don't even talk about much anymore because it is a little sensitive. It's judgments. We have so many judgments about people, places, things, countries, politics, the neighbors, you know, the co-workers, you know, the relatives, you know, and they're insidious. And it's just like we live in this world that's sort of blanketed by judgment, like a cloud, you know, that we live in. And it's so ubiquitous and so normal that we don't even see it because it's going on around us, you know. And we pick up on it. We pick up on it. Years and years ago when I was um, in New York with my book agent, And I was talking to him about this, and he said, oh, really? He was like, ask me about it. And we were walking down the street in Manhattan, and I said, okay, for the next, I don't know, five minutes, don't talk. Just listen. And as we would stop and we hear people talking, it was like, well, yeah, you know, that cab driver, he comes around the corner 100 miles an hour, you know, and then you'd stop and then listen again. Well, I don't think she should have done that. You know what I mean? It was like this, just this, this sort of symphony of judgment. It was going on in conversation. I said, there it is. That's yeah. what goes on in consciousness. So one of the things that blocks hard is judgment. Yeah. And as we began to want, example, going back to wanting again, one of the things that I want is less judgment. I want to love. I want to be caring towards people. I want to be able to have compassion and understanding for folks. I want to connect with them. I don't have to agree with them. I don't have to like all their behaviors or any of that. But I don't want to be in judgment. Yes, yeah. and and it is so important. For example, uh, let's take the the example of athletes and of uh, golf professionals or tennis players or um, even football players. But you know, you you have to be in this kind of flow in this zone and let go of the judgment we have towards ourselves, right? And this is there is a major. Tell us about the research that's been done with athletes because this is really amazing. Yeah, we've done a lot of work at HeartMath with a variety of 
population sectors, you know, everything from corporations to kids to healthcare institutions to government agencies, and it goes on, the people that we've had uh, an opportunity to, to share our work with. One area that we've done some work in is athletes. Athletes want greater performance. They're not necessarily looking for heart. They want better performance at what they do. So when we looked at all this heart-brain communication, we determined there was a state when it was all optimal. It was called coherence. And it's a term many of the listeners have heard now, one that we had a, a, a hand in popularizing. It's psychophysiological coherence is the medical name for it. Highly synchronized physiology where the major body systems are synchronizing with the heart, accompanied by sustained positive emotions. In that state, everything begins to operate more in that flow. And you can measure that by measuring things like improvements in reaction speed time visual field you know there's a certain sensitivity that we get where we're more sensitive about ourselves and we're more sensitive sensitive to what's going on around us it's it's an acuteness in that acuteness is where athletes want to be the other part of what we found with athletes and especially in some sports like golf would be a good example is what they where they really won and lost games a lot of times was in their inability to manage emotions uh as two golf coaches, the two most uh, well-known female golf coaches who are big heart math fans once told me, they said, there's an emotional reaction after every shot. Mm-hmm. And it can be a variety of emotions depending upon the shot, but mm-hmm. there's always an emotional reaction. You know, it went there, I feel this way. It went there, I feel this way. There's an emotional reaction. And what they determined, uh, and heart math work was a part of what they how they determined this, was that learning to regulate those emotions to maintain an emotional balance and and equilibrium was part of what was going to create the quality of the next shot, more of the zone of moving from one shot to the other when they get in that zone. In in sports that are more high speed, uh, what we've trained them to do is to learn to increase their natural coherence baseline so that when they're not thinking about it, it's still a more coherent human being Mm -hmm. that's functioning. Uh, example with that, this is really a fun one. We have um, licensees, representatives that represent us in various parts of the world, and I have a license operation in Scandinavia. It operates out of Sweden. The owner of that company was a former, right to the next level below the, the top level, hockey player. So he has hockey connections. So he has been training hockey teams. And in one case, with the team that he trained, they have the, the technology device that we sell called the M-Wave that measures coherence. And they train them in the M-Wave. And they allow them to use that when they're on the bench. And so yeah. these, so these, he's got, he showed me pictures. The hockey players out there playing this aggressive sport, they even get in trouble and they put them in the penalty box and they pull their M-Wave out. And they begin trying to get back to coherence. Mm-hmm. So they're actually using heart math in the context of in and out of the game, in between the times they were actually on the ice. So what they're looking for is that edge. Mm-hmm. And listen, heart is not squishy, sentimental, all those things. It's a high-performance state. Heart intelligence is highly intelligent. Mm-hmm. It's very aware. It's a high-performance state, useful in athletics, business, relationships, you name it. It's got those qualities to it. So an athlete, like I said, you know, when we work with these athletes, it's like heart big deal uh can you lower my score can you know you help me create uh, a higher percentage of of shooting foul shots can you you know know, that's what they're after so we can apply those benefits and say yeah but we're going to do it this way and it involves heart and that's where the science makes the bridge you see what i'm saying and then the results are quick the results are quick the science makes the bridge if we said we're going to do a heart thing now well they wouldn't listen to us right they say well it's just another heart thing out of california how do these people get in here but <laughs> but you know but we come at it from we're going to teach you about coherence it's a heart-centric state here's the science that supports that here's the peer-reviewed journals that back up what we say so we show hard science around these physiological and psychological states and the changes that occur with heart-centric techniques being used, then they can accept that. Then we teach them simple techniques. They don't care if it's hard or not. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about the, the breathing through the heart. Is there, is there such a thing that we can do? I think I've heard you say that yeah, once. There's a, I mean, the, there's a core technique that is easy for me to share in, in, in an interview environment like we're in today. And I'd like to share that with everyone uh, viewing this now. Mm-hmm. It's called the quick coherence technique designed to get us to a more coherent state quickly. Remember, coherence is highly ordered physiology accompanied with sustained positive emotions. It's good for our health. It's good for our performance. It makes us smarter. There's three simple steps. 
and I'll share those with everyone now. The first step is called heart focus. And what I'd like you to do is focus your attention right here. And you can close your eyes if you'd like. And, of course, you're watching a video now, so you probably don't want to do that, but you can. You focus your attention in the area right here in the center of your chest. You can just feel as maybe as if the energy is going from the head down to that area, maybe like a little elevator going right to there. That's called heart focus. You maintain your heart focus, and you go to the second step, which is called heart-focused breathing. What I'd like you to do is to breathe naturally and normally, but a little deeper than you normally would. Nice, good breaths. And as you do that, I want you to, to, to feel or pretend as if your breath is flowing in and out right from here through the area of the heart, center of the chest. So it's a little deeper breaths. As you inhale, feel it coming in through the center of your chest, the heart area, and then back out through that same area. Now, breathing techniques have been proven to be effective for thousands of years, and I think they're good. I also think what they do is set the stage for something even bigger to happen. It's like a platform. So in step three of this is called heart feeling. In step three, what you're doing is you want to maintain that focus here. You want to continue with your heart-focused breathing, and now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to try to feel a positive heart-related emotion. Maybe it's just the appreciation you have for good things in your life. Maybe you can feel right now the love or the care that you have for someone in your life. Or maybe it's just a sense of well-being that, hey, life's okay, things are good. It doesn't have to be just a big squishy emotion. It can just be a sense of, it's okay, things fine. You feel that feeling as you do your heart-focused breathing. What's happening inside your body right now is your nervous system is aligning. The signals going neurologically from your heart back to brain are becoming more ordered. A blood pressure wave that influences the electrical activity in your brain is now influencing that brain in positive ways. And there are hormones being released in your body that regenerate you, like the anti-aging hormone DHEA increases when we're in this state. All that adds up to a much enhanced physiological and psychological state. In this state, beyond the science, into what I've experienced and what my belief is, is that you now are able to access more of the field of consciousness because you're more coherent. It's more, you're more receptive to something larger than yourself. A place inside yourself where you can be more than you usually are. When you move beyond the mediocrity and you're able to do the things that you, know, you think you might can't, but now you think you can. All these changes begin to occur more readily when we're making contact here. We're operating more from that internal coherent state. And that's the three simple steps you can use to get yourself there from time to time. Heart focus, heart focus breathing, and then the activation of a heart feeling. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. I, I, I know all, most of us could feel that. Very, very powerful. Tell us about your latest research here and how you can see that uh, through big groups of people coming together in a heart coherence. This can actually really change the field of the planet. Yeah, well, we understand how to measure individual coherence, and we the work we do in organizations through our organizational training programs. We uh, use psychometric surveys and things like that. We know how to measure collective coherence in a way within an organization. About five years ago, we said, let's start trying to look at how we can measure global coherence. And so that's been a cool project for us. And so we have a, a part of heart math called the Global Coherence Initiative. And I'd like you to look at that website when you have a chance. It's glcoherence.org, but Global Coherence Initiative. It's a little membership organization where membership is free, designed to bring people from all around the world together to use our heart focus, care, and intention to help shift planetary consciousness out of some of that discord and chaos and you know, lack of harmony into a more harmonious state with more care and enduring peace. So we have now something like 55,000 members. They come from over 100 countries. Uh, they get information about coherence, building steps and techniques. We come together from time to time, at least once a month, where we uh, use that heart focus, care, and intention to address a planetary issue. There's a place inside the site called the Care Focus Room. This is really cool. You go to this part of the site, and there's a globe in there. And on this globe of the Earth, it's, you can move it and spin it and all that. It's really beautiful. But when you log in, it marks with a little gold light 
where your internet provider address is. Doesn't mean your house, but it means like near, you know, where you are, your internet provider. And what you see when you go there are people all around the world who are there when you're there. Mm. And they're everywhere, little gold light markers around the globe. And you get a sense, whoa, this, this is just people here on this, one, on this one site right now putting their heart out, but they're here right now. This morning, we put out one for around the full moon for this month. We had something like 400 and some people in there at one time, all in there. You know, from all around the world, yeah. you know, doing that. That's just an example of things that members get. So there are many organizations who are doing similar things and synchronous meditations and bringing people yeah. together for various social causes and social interests. And the, the Internet's provided the ability to do that so well and so effectively. And I'm glad about that. I applaud that. What we also brought to this was our science. Yeah. And that's what I think you're, talking, you're alluding to. So our scientists developed very sensitive technology that measures changes in the Earth's energetic fields. The Earth is a living system. It has energetic fields. They're part of our nature in a sense. The protective layers around the Earth that protect us from incoming solar radiation, cosmic rays, things that would prevent life from being here. Those fields are in constant fluctuation and change. There are two primary ones, the geomagnetic field and the ionosphere. And science knows that uh, through many studies done over a long period of time, that these fields are changing all the time from natural occurring things like solar flares and things like mm. that. And that when they change, that they affect us. Mm. They affect our psychological states. They affect our physiological states. They affect group and organizational and um, societal behaviors. This is all well known. So what we also believe is that we, the human race, the seven billion of us on this planet and growing influence those fields as well. It's a hypothesis. We believe that mass human emotion, whether positive or negative, has a measurable impact on the Earth's energetic fields. Mm. So what our researchers have done is develop sensing technology that can measure changes in these fields. And we are developing the Global Coherence Monitoring System, placing sensor sites around the planet strategically. There will eventually be 12, which will be able to see the entire arc of the ionosphere and the geomagnetic field. Mm. Today, there are four that are in place right now, sending data back to our research labs here in Boulder Creek. There's one in Northern California. There's one in Northern Canada. There's one in the United Kingdom. There's one in Saudi Arabia. The fifth sensor goes in very soon in New Zealand, and then a sixth sensor in um, South Africa. And there'll be six more placed over time. So what we're doing is we're studying these fields, mm -hmm. and we're getting data back. And we're, you know, we're in the process now of, of um, it's what's called the adopt a scientist thing you'll see on the Global Coherence website. So we can have more scientists working on this to interpret the data and understand. So we're, we're learning more about these fields. We're learning more about how the fields affect us. And we are beginning to do experiments, and we'll continue over time to do experiments to see if the hypothesis is true. Are our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings, our prayers, our meditations, all of those things, are they in fact putting out an energy that can be measured in the earth itself? Mm. If that's true, I think we'll have proved something that's a paradigm shift. Mm. We have to see if it's true or if it's not. That's true science. But our belief for a number of reasons is that the possibility is very strong that that occurs. So that's some of the new science that we're doing. So it's a very exciting project. You can become a member, again, for free. And become part of this, this community of people around the world who are part of this, who are using something we all have, which is right here in the middle of our chest, the beauty of our heart, to make a difference in the consciousness field and to participate in a long-term study looking at these things. This is not trivial science. Mm -hmm. This isn't putting up a sensor in the backyard. We all stand around it and pray and we see a needle move. This is big-time science. But it's important science, I think, in looking at both consciousness and looking at the understanding of the Earth itself. Yeah. Does this also work for particular events, like uh, if there is violence in a city, for example? Has that been studied? If, if some people really focus on that with heart-based? We think it could. Um, you know, we're looking at data now, and, and there's a lot that has to be considered in the data analysis of this. We, uh, researchers, I think, are seeing things. They're very cautious. Because this research is so important that it can never be written off as pseudoscience. It has to be done right so that it cannot be, you know, attacked from detractors of these kind of things as much. All science gets challenged, but, you know, we don't want to invite that. So I think they're seeing things, and there's some interesting studies on the Global Coherence Initiative website looking at changes occurring in heart rate variability patterns and things that they're doing, studies that were done 
you know, with, with populations in Saudi Arabia, for example. There's certain correlations they've seen to the Arab Spring and things like that. But they're not saying as much as they maybe know, uh, especially to someone like me who ends up on a lot of interviews <laughs> because, because they want to make sure it's done well. So I'm not armed to say this is true, that's true, that in an event in the city we can influence that, etc. My belief is, is yes, we do. Uh, that's my personal belief. Um, so there's a difference, I think, between what's what I can say to the viewers today that's scientifically validated and real and what my true belief may be that hasn't been validated yet. I don't think science is the answer to everything. I don't think we have to have science to, to believe everything. Uh, I think it helps, and it does help with people who would ne not necessarily be as predisposed to these kind of beliefs. But there are many things that I experience and I believe that, you know, that uh, go beyond just the science. But for a lot of us that maybe have partners that don't believe or don't understand that, you know, we want to like, oh, check our mouths, come on. <laughs> You'll see what they're doing. <laughs> I'd like to have a dollar for every every woman who's told me that this is something that they finally got their husband to <laughs> to, to participate in because we had science and we looked real, you know what I mean? And uh, so, yeah, we built a good bridge there for people. Um, to, and I think it's important. I'm not in judgment about that. I just think that a lot of times people need that to, to believe in, in other interviews from time to time, I've said that I think what our science does is go ahead and give our mind permission to believe in the heart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To relax and relax. experience. Say, okay, now uh, this is it. These guys have got science. That means I can mm -hmm. and take the heart, you know, for what it is. And uh, it, it makes it easier. It makes, the, it makes that process easier. Because, you know, when heart and brain work together. There's no competition here. I want to be clear with that to any, yeah. any viewer. But... You know, it's it's a, as if the brain gets credit for everything, you know, and it's like science now knows that we have intelligences throughout our entire biology, right on down to the, the intelligence we find in ourselves. And so it's a distributed intelligence throughout the human form. And heart plays a key role in that. Um, but there's no comp competition between the two. They, they're working consort. They're both exchanging information all the time. Yeah. So the heart helps us to access consciousness, helps us to connect with this this unified field, right, and get new ideas, get insight, make the right move in life? Yeah, I believe, that's what I believe. I believe that it is through heart where spirit merges with our humanness. Yeah. And the term I use spirit right now would be a generic term for what you just said, the larger field of consciousness. People call it universal source. People call it higher self. People call it Christ self. I'm just saying the term spirit. But it is where through here where spirit manifests into something that we then bring into daily living. And that's been my personal experience and the experience that I've seen in many, many other people that I've been associated with or worked with for a long time. I've seen that very clearly, and that's just what I believe. Now, there's, if you look at the broader scope of heart math research, you know, I've asked them from the highest level mission, you can, you can, tell me what are you guys trying to do and they'll say to me we're trying to prove the existence of spirit and how it manifests in humans mm. so we're not talking here about the god particle <laughs> and we're talking about a lot of things yeah but it's a big deal going on out there you know so we're, we're just doing their part but we sort of build it again from the ground up so that it has a practicality to it i mean there are many many exciting things to study right now and they inspire people and i think that's good and at the same time there's a certain baseline bottom line approach that I think is even more important and it's about how we how we approach life how we manage our emotions what attitudes do we hold how quickly do we move out of judgment and blame and upset and anger into the place that we really want to be how quick do those shifts occur uh, how much emphasis are we putting on that those kind of things are really what puts out the energy I think that makes the world a better place mm -hmm. and I think a lot of that's going on mm -hmm. I think many people have already are doing that more consciously now and that's while we are where we are today in a pretty good place mm. the world's changing it's not as dire as we think it is you know there's certainly some huge challenges out there and i recognize that i'm not not blind to that but on the other side of it we're moving so quickly to something so much better so much more grandiose the new world is emerging and we're seeing that begin to, to manifest it in tangible ways now more work to go and more road to walk and more challenges to overcome that's for sure but a way i think the way i think we get there is manifesting in ourselves in very practical ways more of the qualities of the heart mm. and putting out more love and more care mm. and more compassion and more con kindness and knocking off some of the blames and the judgments and the lack of appreciations and things like that, learning to, to regulate those more. And then 
the cosmic stuff, the fun science that goes and associate with that, that's just more fun. That's add-ons to the whole whole thing. And I mean, I'm, a lot of my friends are the ones that talk about those things. I'm certainly not down on it. And there's a, a small handful of us that really sort of represent the science meets consciousness people. You know, I'm also uh, a proponent of the science meets consciousness. And then what are you going to do with it crowd? You know, mm-hmm. how are you going to make that part of your day? Mm-hmm. So that when I leave your interview, if I have to go back to look at an email or check my voicemails and I find that there's something there that I didn't expect, it's not what I wanted. Uh, what am I going to do with that? Is that going to is that going to ruin the rest of my evening, or am I going to be able to? I'm not saying it's going to happen, but if it did, is that going to ruin the rest of my evening, or am I going to make a quicker shift? Am I going to be to another level of acceptance about that, and make peace with it, and move on? To me, that's the game. Mm. Knowing that there's people here from all around the world that are watching this video, is there a message that you would like to 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 bring and to really say, so that all together, all of us, all around the world, can really practice or put this in place, or or think of that? Yeah, for anyone in the world today, all of us human beings, all are energetically connected. Modern science is even showing us all that now. We're all in this together, and we're all part of a grand unfoldment that's happening on our planet. And what I'd like to say to everybody who's viewing right now from wherever you happen to be seeing this from is this. The times we live in provide great opportunity, but they can often be challenging because the huge amount of change that's happening in a short amount of time. I'd like you to have more compassion for yourself. More love and more compassion for yourself. Recognize you're a good person. You're doing the very best you can. You're making a valuable contribution through the world by just simply being here and being alive. The shift is happening. You don't have to push and and, and, and make it so hard. There's a flow to it all. It's really about finding the flow with the shift. And the way you do that is a more heart-centric approach, especially with yourself. Mm. Be kind and gentle to yourself and compassion to yourself. As you do that, you're actually making a very big contribution to the whole, to the world. It's an important contribution because you will be coming into another level of resonance in yourself. You put an energy out into the consciousness field and environment, and that makes it easier for all of us. So the message is very simple. Be compassionate with yourself. Give yourself that gift. You earned it. You owe, you you deserve it. And just find it in your heart when times get tough. Beautiful. Thank you, Howard. Thank you for this delicious conversation, my beautiful co-creators, juicy co-creators out there. Sending you much, much love from beautiful California. Bye now. Bye.